All right, please take it away. All right, thanks, Tim. Um, all right, so today's session is about Experience Builder. Uh, I'm Lauri Timani, uh, formerly known as Floria Scola. Um, so what we're going to cover today is uh, why do we need the Experience Builder? Why are we working on, on, on this? Um, then we are going to cover what is Experience Builder? I'm going to demo some of the things that we have today. It's not going to be very interactive from the perspective that we haven't necessarily built a lot of things, but I'm at least going to show what kinds of assets we have or artifacts we have today for the experience builder. Uh, then, then I'm going to go cover some of the roadmap and uh, how we're planning to tackle some of those things that needs to be built. And then we have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so how the... Experience Builder fits in the Drupal Starshot. Uh, is it fits in sort of the second epic that Dries presented in the Drupal uh, Drupal Starshot product definition uh, workshop. So Experience Builder is something that heavily relates to the part where uh, we're trying to make it easier for site builders to uh, create sites using Drupal. Um, so that's kind of. This is uh, so. So the whole experience builder initiative falls in under that second epic of Drupal Starshot. Um, so how we got started with the experience builder was that we did some discovery uh, last year. We talked to a whole bunch of um, people from uh, various different organizations. Um, so we and we tried to have a diverse set of organizations participating in that research, uh, from freelancers to the large enterprises. Uh, we also tested plenty of competing products just to kind of understand what kinds of other tools uh, these folks are are using. Um, basically, what we discovered as part of that research was that uh, there was no um, clarity on which one was uh, a clear winner. Uh, many of the organizations had built their own uh, ecosystems on top of one of these. Some of them were picking uh, different solutions depending on what kinds of client requirements they had in a project. Uh, but the challenge was that uh, there wasn't necessarily one solution that uh, was perfect for them so that they could build sort of their whole um, ecosystem on top of that, at least without uh, writing a significant amount of custom code on top of it. And even after writing significant significant amount of custom code, it, there were still uh, plenty of challenges that they were facing. Uh, the challenge that they, uh, many of these organizations were, were uh, talking about was that uh, Layout Builder is really complex for them to use, uh, both from the perspective of uh, content creation, but also from the perspective of trying to get a new developer working on defining components or blocks within the um, page builder, whether that was Layout Builder or, or Powercast. Um, there's some interesting anecdotes that I heard from there where some organizations have specifically hired some more technical people there to their content teams in order for them to build skeleton, skeleton pages with layout builder, um, just to enable the content creators to then go in and sort of add in the content in there. So that was not like a designer role. It was more like just like a, a Drupal layout builder person coming in and, and creating layout builder pages. Um, it's also really challenging and time consuming for organizations to integrate their uh, these existing solutions with JavaScript. I know that there's many organizations experimenting with uh, headless, uh, in particular with paragraphs. Uh, the challenge there is that um, it, um, even though that is technically possible, it, it, it tends to lead into a lot of code that the organization needs to write um, on their side. Um, so obviously, like there's no uh, basically, we heard about a lot of challenges uh, from these organizations, from these agencies. All of these agencies were organizations with uh, long background, long history using Drupal. Um, and then, you know, if you try to imagine how would that experience be for someone uh, who is not within a Drupal agency or doesn't have ten years of experience with Drupal, uh, you can imagine that it would probably be really challenging for them to get started with this experience. Uh, what we also learned was that there's many organizations who has historically been loyal to Drupal, but they are now choosing competing solutions like WordPress or others, just because of they were not satisfied with the page building experience of Drupal. 
Um, so basically, based on this, we we figured that it's it's obvious that we need to make the whole page building experience much easier than what it is today. Um, essentially, creators should be able to start creating pages without requiring requiring on onboarding from the agency. Um, there might be some onboarding that you need on sort of how the design system works and and so on, but you should not have to be taught how the system itself works. Um, you should not need Drupal or senior developers just to set up the page builder. So today, many agencies are spending weeks or months to, to tailor that experience, but uh, that should not be required uh, in the end. They should be able to focus on just defining the components and, and the designs that uh, they want their content creators to be able to uh, create through the page builder. And it should be really simple for uh, you know someone who doesn't write a lot of code to uh, integrate with an existing design system uh, without having that Drupal uh, person helping them. Um, there's a link to an issue where I've documented in more detail um, sort of findings from that research in case that you want to uh, read sort of, you know, all of the different things that uh, were discovered as part of that research. So that's in the um, experience builder issue queue. Uh, it looks like someone has their hand raised. Is there a question? Probably not. So I'm going to uh, continue. Um, so basically, why we need the experience builder is because of we've come to the conclusion that site builders and junior developers want to quickly create digital experiences and implement designs that match their brand to enable content creators to publish high quality content. And they expect to do so with visual browser based tools that require minimal technical expertise. So in order to be able to do something like this, we need a well thought out process end to end. So basically from the moment that you've installed Drupal uh, to the moment that you can launch your site. So you can imagine that sort of how we are thinking about the user journey is what happens after the installation in the configuration stage and needs to happen before this launch stage. So we need to look at the user journey holistically from that uh, perspective. So that we consider everything from uh, selecting and installing a theme to uh, you know creating those, those uh, pages that contain content. And that's where uh, our mission statement then comes in. Uh, so the Drupal Experience Builder's mission statement is that Drupal's new Experience Builder will enable site builders without Drupal experience to easily theme and built their entire website using only their browser. And it will enable content creators to compose content on any part of the page without relying on developers. Unlike competing tools, it will be better for content reuse across channels and managing content on a large scale because it will enforce data and design consistency. Um, so you can see that um, we are aiming the experience builder to be competitive with the other page builders from the ease of use perspective, but we are going to build it on top of sort of the key capabilities of Drupal, which is structured data and uh, and uh, enabling a broad set of um, content creators to create content without losing that uh, design consistency. Um, so what we basically did after we had done all of this um, discovery was figure out what would be the best way for us to uh, start building something like this. So we looked into potential solutions that exist out there. And uh, we focused primarily on um, open source solutions such as Gutenberg, uh, Plasmic, and then the Drupal-based layout builder and uh, and the paragraphs. And as you can see, the, the, the table is um, somewhat balanced. There's a lot of red on a lot of the different columns. So there wasn't like one solution which was clearly the best for us, uh, especially we spend a lot of time uh, figuring out if we should go with Gutenberg um, or if we should go with the Drupal-based layout builder uh, or paragraphs. And sort of where the key challenge came in was was with the uh, with the Gutenberg, where um, the architecture that Gutenberg has was really challenging for us to uh, build into something where we could. Uh, make it really easy for someone to extend it through code. So Gutenberg is essentially uh, built 
as if it's a text editor. And extending Gutenberg uh, from a uh, developer's perspective is similar to extending um, Drupal CK editor or, or CK editor, which is in Drupal. And um, that means that there's a lot of complexity involved in extending it versus what we are trying to do with the experience builder is an experience where you can uh, integrate your components with the experience builder without the, the component author necessarily having to think too much about the fact that it's going to end up in the experience builder. So it's going a little bit more towards the product direction of, of the um, DXC platforms like Plasmic, where um, you can have a React component and uh, you can just write a little bit of integration code where you define that uh, my component has these props. And uh, based on that knowledge, the, the page builder can sort of generate all of the UIs for it. So we want the experience to, to be a little bit closer to that. Obviously, we are going to build this on top of the sort of Drupal native uh, concepts, such as SDC instead of React, but just using that as a reference because of conceptually, we want it to be similar. Uh, so with the layout builder and paragraphs, the key challenge that we identified was just that there's a lot of work that is involved in trying to convert one of these existing tools into an experience like that, and that we would need um, a lot of exp expertise in terms of uh, crafting the, the right type of user experience that we need for this. Whereas if we went with Gutenberg or, or Plasmic, they already have really well-defined user experience. Um, that we could just leverage out of the box, um, uh, meaning that we wouldn't have to necessarily figure out ourselves how to, how to define that user experience. Um, we we somehow we we kind of felt as we made this decision that it's built for the right type of persona from the get go, and that we had the control over the platform to more than what we would have with Gutenberg or Plasmic, uh, because of Gutenberg is built largely for the content creator or no code creator type of person. And it could be very challenging for us to change that uh, without sacrificing um, you know, things that are important for, for their users. So that's sort of on a high level, the rationale for why we decided to go, to go with layout builder slash paragraphs. So basically what the experience builder is, is it's going to combine the best of layout builder and paragraphs, um, add on top of that the in-browser teaming capabilities uh, that are built on top of the single directory components that exist already today. And all of this combined then becomes the experience builder. All right? So where we are today with this is that basically what we have done so far is we've sort of defined what is our vision for the experience builder. Uh, so we've created some concept wireframes for this to showcase that this is roughly the type of experience that we would like to, to create for this. Laurie, can and, I interrupt you? Yeah. There was a request in the chat. I don't know if you can do this right now it, to see if you could put the link to the slides in while you're still presenting so people can follow directly. I'm not sure yes, if that's... I can do. I think I can do that. Um, all right. Oh, someone may have even beat you to it, but we'll see. All right. You should have access to the slides now. Thank you very much. All right. Um, yeah, so what we have done so far is we've de uh, defined the vision and uh, concept wireframes. I'm going to show some of that in the in the demo section. Uh, we've also defined high-level product requirements and user stories uh, for the experience builder. Uh, but what we are working on today is uh, defining sort of detailed user flows, uh, detailed wireframes for what that experience would look like. And uh, once we have uh, once we once we are in a better place with the user flows and wireframes, then we can define a sort of little bit more complete architecture plan for this. Uh, so we will know exactly that these are the parts that we can leverage from Layout Builder. These are the parts that we can probably take from Paragraphs. We have some ideas around that already today because we know sort of roughly what the vision is and the direction that we're taking. But um, you know, sol solidifying those is 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 a little bit challenging before we've 
define user flows and wireframes in more detail. Um, we also have some folks building uh, some of that code foundations for this. Uh, some of it is just to build proof of concepts around you know what we think would be possible from technical perspective. Some of it is to, to build code for the parts that we know, regardless of what the user flows or wireframes are, uh, would be the same. Um, so there's some things that we know are, uh, are probably going to be largely unchanged, regardless of what kind of UX we're building. Um, so things like that are being worked on today. Um, what we haven't started on yet is the detailed backlog. Um, essentially, to, to create a detailed back, backlog, we felt that we probably need to have a little bit more clarity on what that architecture will be and what those user flows and wireframes will be. Uh, Niels, you have your hand up. All right. Sorry, sorry, wrong button. No worries. Um, all right. Then moving on to the demo part. Um, so I'm gonna start by just showing a couple screenshots that I have in the slides, and then we can I can I can uh, walk through a couple things in in Figma on top of that. So um, here's sort of the the initial concept wireframe which we created. Uh, the key part here is that um, in this uh, on the center of the page, uh, what I have now highlighted here is a preview of what you would be seeing on the actual page. Because this is right now, this is a very minimalistic page that I have um, in this concept wireframe, but this would be showing uh, a preview of what that page would look like uh, on the uh, act actual uh, page one once it has been saved. So it's, it's kind of a visible type of experience that you would be getting in here. On the right sidebar, what we can see is uh, um, things like, uh, what is the title of this page? Um, maybe a cover image for you know um, setting a he uh, a hero or or maybe displaying it under the page title, and then your meta information. And the key key uh, difference here is that uh, you can do all of this from a single page. You don't have to navigate between different pages um, to achieve this. Uh, so we can take a look at um, this in Figma. In a little bit more detail. Oops, I have um, wrong Figma file open. Um, so we can see, for example, here, there's a button which could open this to be a larger. So do you have you have more space for editing the sidebar? And all of this is still on the concept level. So uh, the specific UX of what this is going to be is going to be. We don't see the Figma. Oh, we don't see the Figma window. I see. I shared a specific. All right. You should see uh, Figma now. Is that correct now? Yes. There yeah. we go. OK. Sorry about that. Um, so walking through that again. So we can see on the right sidebar, there's um, um, I, uh, a button, which allows you to expand the right sidebar. Um, so do you, you have more space for editing the form. Um, we can see that um, components have been now uh, will be grouped so that it's easy to find what you need. Um, you can drag and drop components to the uh, preview. Um, once you've drag and drop components in there, um, you would have some default content within the component. Um, once you click the, the component, it opens up an edit form for that component. And you can also add um, more complex things. So components are generally more primitive in the sense that they are like maybe a single component, maybe a paragraph, maybe a, a card. You could also have more co uh, complex things uh, where uh, in this example, we have, for example, a uh, uh, contributors block. I don't know if I have that uh, actually as an example in here as a as something that we've added to the page. Looks like we don't. So the contributors block could be something where we have uh, four images side by side, and then the images have been inserted there automatically. The idea of the pattern is that it's a starting point for um, the, the content creator. Uh, it's not necessarily something that would be locked down. I actually have another. Um, I have a later on 
a link to um, uh, one where we explain sort of uh, some of these concepts in, in more detail. And the final one is that you can um, also, you don't, you, you, uh, besides the visual preview, you can also preview the structure of the page. So you can kind of see that these are the components that I have on this page, and you can drag the components using the, so the, so the hierarchy of that page. Uh, so you, do, you don't purely have to rely on the visuals of, of what you can see in the preview, which could be helpful in the case that if you have, for example, a slider component, um, it can be a little bit annoying to work with those from the from the preview. So from the uh, from the layers perspective, you can kind of see what are all of the different options inside that component. Um, so like I said, this is still um, just on a concept stage. So we have some UX designers who are working on currently defining what that exact UX would look like uh, for all of this. Um, I actually have one screenshot just as a very brief. Um, I, so there are several screens that they are working on. I just took one as an example from from that work. Uh, so uh, where we can see that you know it's it's going to look a little bit more polished and it's going to also uh, have a lot more detail once we have those UX wireframes defined. Um, so there's a bunch of other things that we've been working on. So obviously this is sort of the high level of these are the kinds of capabilities that we probably want to have in the, the page builder itself. Um, so we've also had to spend some time to define what are the different types of content that you can create uh, with the page builder to give a better idea on what are the capabilities that would be needed in there. Uh, so what we've done is, for example, here's a breakdown of different, different kinds of content uh, that you could be creating with uh, the page builder. And here's an example of sort of a common scenario that many of the um, uh, users that we talked to wanted to try to implement with page builder and Drupal. Um, so the example here is that uh, a hybrid content type where we have both structured and unstructured data. Um, and the example that I pulled in here is a university program uh, page for Alda University. And uh, for this university program page, there's a structured title, structured description, structured image, um, and then some information about the program itself. The idea of the structured fields is that basically as a person who sets up the site, they want to make sure that this information must always exist in order to have um, you know, a university program so that you can then, using that information, render this page, but you can make different kinds of displays. Like for example, what this uh, site is doing is they are doing uh, like a search uh, listing type of teaser for it. And you can see that they are sort of pulling in that same information. They are pulling in the image, the title, and uh, the description, and they are displaying it using a display mode. Um, so that is pretty basic uh, Drupal stuff uh, that we know. But the exciting part of this is that um, you would want to do then that unstructured content in combination with, with structured content. So you would want to start defining things like, you know, we just want to add some par paragraphs in here. And, you know, maybe we want to pull in like a, a reference as part of, of this content. So I want to take this like School of Science graduates in, in Working Life node and pull it in, in here and use a display that has been defined uh, elsewhere so that if someone goes and updates these things, it actually gets reflected on this page as well. Uh, and there's some little bit more interesting things like an accordion, um, as, a, as well as more uh, content composition. Um, sort of the final concept that, that we have in here is that there's some, so we, have, we had some fields that are specific to this piece of content, but there's the content type that we, which specify which information you need. Then we have the drop, show, drop zone slash slot, which is completely sort of free form up to the content creator to define what you have inside there. Uh, what we are also now including inside that template, uh, and, and by template, I'm calling now the part which has been fixed on top of this page. Uh, there's also a global application period block. And the idea is that across all of the different pages, um, and not even necessarily on the university program pages, that this could be across um, 
non-university program pages, they want to display um, a block on whether the university application period is open or closed. And they want to be able to sort of globally update that to all of the pages that, that would be displaying that information. Uh, so, so this is what we are using as sort of, all right, this is the type of content that we want someone to be able to create with the experience builder. How might we create uh, a UI and set of capabilities that makes it really easy for a builder to define something like this? Um, so that is one of the assets that we have. Um, then there's um, Drupal.org issue for defining how are we, how would people want to be combining different comp uh, combina uh, different components uh, into uh, components that the content creator is then able to use within the form. Uh, so for example, we are talking about things like uh, uh, slots versus props or whether the props should be managed by the the parent component or or the child component. So an example of that would be, let's say, what do we have here as an example? Maybe I need to open this so that we can see it a little bit better. Um, interesting. So I guess this was split in two. All right, so this one, I, I have the actual forms in here. Um, so we can see, for example, here that um, uh, in the first example, there's two drop zones, uh, meaning that um, the content creator would be able to pull in uh, like a two column component, and they would be allowed to put in anything in these uh, two columns. So that's pretty similar to what we have in Layout Builder today, where you have these uh, sections, and then you can pull in specific components in there. Uh, the second example, which we have in here, is something where, let me actually refer back to the to the colors, um, because these were just changed recently. Uh, so the, the purple is referring to a um, concept where you have another component baked into the, the component. So basically what we are, what we are saying here is that um, on the left, there's a, a heading component, there's a paragraph component, and button component. Uh, I'm reusing those components and I'm taking their fields to be as part of the, uh, the parent component. Uh, so if you go and update that child components uh, properties, it would also update um, this component that we've created in here. But then on the right side, you can put in uh, kind of uh, more free form uh, components, what you want in, in there as a content creator. And then we have one more example, which is essentially just that um, you could have, uh, um, let's look at the slotted component. So basically there's a, um, a slot where there's been, um, uh, where there's, where there's um, uh, components in here and they've been defined by the, the, uh, the builder uh, themselves, but you would be able to remove them and change them later on. And then we have a final one in here, which is ultimately, uh, well, actually this one is the final one. So this one is an example of a component where we've just defined props for the parent component. And we've essentially just created copies of those props for the parent component. And we are just like linking them to the child components. And this is a concept that doesn't really exist in the, in, in Layout Builder at all. And today, actually many of these concepts don't exist in Layout Builder uh, today. This is uh, combining definitely the, the paragraphs components. This is combining some co uh, concepts from Site Studio uh, as, as well as uh, Layout Builder in terms of the sections. And we have examples on the right side in here of how we would imagine that form to actually look like for the content creator for each of these, these components. So this, this is definitely something where it would be helpful to get feedback from, uh, from folks. And the final one, which we have, it looks like Eric has a uh, hand raised. Yeah, I had a question about the, um, you mentioned the properties, the custom properties that are pretty much just copies, but kind of bespoke. Um, is if we're moving SDC to use JSON schemas to uh, describe themselves with properties, um, would this not be an extension of ref or one of as part of that JSON schema to reference other properties that already exist? 
yeah, so there's some discussion around whether to use refs or or not. So I think refs conceptually provide something really close to this. There's some challenges where refs could be, as a syntax, could be a little bit challenging to teach for developers or, or developers who are not familiar with JSON schema. But um, sure. yeah, conceptually, it is very similar to what we are talking. And what we are ma mainly discussing if there's some ways that we can make it really simple to reference other components from uh, using refs or or something similar. Any other questions about uh, the component types? I think that was a, that was a great question. Thanks, Eric. All right, I'm gonna move on, and we can take questions on this at the at the end in case there's any. Uh, so the one more assets that I wanted to just show briefly is that um, so we um, we also uh, defined we are using one of the Drupal.org uh, designs as sort of guiding. Um, North Star for what we're building. So what we are what we are using this for is we are essentially saying that okay, uh, in the demo that we are creating, we would like to be able to represent a design system like this. We would want the uh, a content creator to be able to create a page like this. What are the capabilities that we need in order to be able to build a page like this? Um, I'm not going to walk through this in detail, but it's helpful just for context that we are using that that's kind of one of the approaches that we're taking to defining, you know, what kinds of things do you, do we need in here? Um, so that's sort of what kinds of assets we have today, what artifacts we uh, exist today. Um, like I said, the UX wireframes and, uh, um, arch architecture is still being worked on and, uh, uh, we will probably have a little bit more to show in the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, next up is I, I want to talk a little bit about how we are um, structuring the work today. So we've split the work into two tracks, where the first track is content creation uh, and defining the user experience for the experience builder and specifically focused around content creation. So that's what we are starting with. So the content creation needs to be sort of driving a lot of the other decisions. Uh, down the line for us. That's the, the key consideration for us. So what we're planning to do as part of this is we are planning to create a demo that showcases that the new user experience that we are imagining for the experience builder. So we've defined and prioritized user stories uh, for this demo. And uh, so there's six user stories that are focused around content creation that we are focused on on tackling first. In terms of the user experience and and you know what we what we include in the demo, uh, we also have a Drupal org issue uh, where we uh, uh, we are tracking sort of the progress towards this. Um, so there's a couple uh, sort of sub parts of this work. So there's two child issues today. Uh, so this is the parent issue, which is to find sort of the high level vision of of these are the things that we want to have in the demo. This is how we are planning to approach that. And then we have one issue, which is this early phase front-end work coordination, which is for the things that we need for the experience builder, uh, the builder itself. And then we have another one, which is for implementing that design system that I showed uh, using SDC. Um, and, and obviously, we would have to work on these two things uh, in close collaboration so that we can make sure that anything that is happening on the design system sides uh, works on the experience builder itself. Um, so that's the track one, which we've defined. The track two is around backend foundations. Um, so that is about establishing a stable foundation for the page builder and theme builder. Uh, so ultimately, the, the experience builder as a whole, and um, and and making sure that whatever we built on the on that side is is aligned with this content creation um, side of things. Uh, so what we are doing on on part of this track is defining the architecture. Um, data model, um, what types of configuration schemas we need, and so on. And the user stories around this are then focused a little bit more around, uh, you know, what would you need as a as a builder, as well as you know things like what does it actually take to to save content using the experience builder. Uh, we also have a Drupal org issue where we are are tracking all of this work. Um, so there's. Uh, it's a sort of a sibling issue, the front end work. So it's called early phase 
backend work coordination. And that's where all of that work is happening today. Um, so this is largely what we would be wor working in 2024. Uh, we've also defined a little bit about what we would be doing in, uh, you know, uh, beyond 2024. So uh, we've shared a document in the uh, Slack channel around uh, proposed milestones for the experience builder. Um, so we are aiming that it's actually saying uh, end of quarter one here. I think it should be saying um, H1 2024. It's uh, fixed now. So we're hoping to, to, to launch a 1.0 release in the uh, H1 2024. But obviously, all of the timelines are still, uh, you know, uh, in flux, given that um, a lot of the work that we're doing de depends on uh, contributors um, helping us, us make, make this happen. This is roughly based on um, the amount of work, uh, help we are expecting to be able to get both from uh, uh, organizations that are heavily contributing to this. So for example, Acquia is, is investing heavily in the experience builder. So we can make some assumptions based on how much they are uh, planning to give allocation to work on things like this. Uh, so in the proposed milestones, we've defined sort of what kinds of things are we planning to tackle in which order? What kinds of things are we expecting to have in the in initial release? And what kinds of things would we be pushing beyond the one uh, the, the initial release? Obviously, uh, obviously even the, the contents of the specific releases is still uh, something that can be uh, changed later on. This is a sort of a rough idea on what we are working with today. Um, then beyond the proposed milestones, we also have a a uh, long list of uh, user stories that we've uh, worked to define. Uh, so there's 76, 76 rows of user stories that we have in here. Uh, this can be a little bit overwhelming on its own. It can be helpful to just you know get a sense of all of the things that exist. Uh, but this is more helpful and in context with the milestone. So basically, in here in the capabilities, we are referring to things that exist in the um, Experience Builder requirements document. So you can see that, for example, here in the 0 0.1 release, we expect to have the capability tree. So then you can go to the ID tree and see that, OK, this is a capability that we, we are expecting to have there. And then you can kind of see which kinds of user stories would we be considering at which points of the, of the milestones. Um, all right. So that's sort of where we are today with the Experience Builder. Um, we are working on this in the Drupal Dark experience experience builder project. Um, so there's a lot of activity in the in the issue queue there. Uh, so feel free to chime in in there in case that you have you have thoughts. Um, we also are coll collaborating on Drupal Slack on the experience builder channel. Uh, there's a weekly uh, asynchronous meeting happening on Thursdays, and um, it's it, the the concept of of the the meetly uh, meetly weekly meeting is that uh we are we are running it for 24 hours um uh, and uh we are essentially setting up threads for specific things that we want to catch up on on a weekly basis so uh things like you know what have you been up to last week what are you planning to work on next week any blockers that we need to be discussing and uh and so on and uh that can be a helpful place also to get information about what are people working on currently and uh where there's an opportunity to be involved um, so that's sort of the prepared agenda that I had. I'm sure that there's plenty of questions from uh, from folks. Uh, so I think it's uh, we have some time for that uh, right now. Maybe I should try to read a little bit of what is in the chat uh, because I haven't been able to keep track of that. Yeah, Lori, I've been directing people to repost questions to the Q&A mm -hmm. tab. So I think you'll see them all there. Um, all right. Yeah happy. yeah, happy to ask from there. I think... One that appeared multiple times is if core layout builder isn't the potential basis for experience builder, has there been discussions around migration paths for layout builder to experience builder? So we are trying to use as much of the existing concept from layout builder within the experience builder. So there's some things that are going to change about the experience builder, but things like um, you know layout builder blocks or layout builder sections slash, slash lay, layouts. We're anticipating to, to continue work in the in the experience builder, kind of. So so basically, we are expecting that if you have layout builder 
off the shelf running on your site. It's going to be a seamless experience moving from layout builder to experience builder. Where it could be a little bit more challenging is that because a, a lot of sites are using layout builder with 10 or more contributor module ext extending layout builder. And that's where it's, it's a little bit harder to guarantee that there's going to be a seamless uh, experience to move from, from layout builder to the experience builder. Because of many of the concepts that are, are implemented by the uh, layout builder modules will be um, sort of redefined by experience builder. All right. Uh, same question about layout paragraphs. So is there a discussion about being able to migrate existing systems pages built with tools like layout paragraphs, for example, or just paragraphs in general into the new experience builder, wondering about backwards compatibility in general? Um, so we did some very initial, we had some very initial discussions around so, uh, providing a migration path or, or path from layout uh, paragraphs or paragraphs into the experience builder. And uh, we believe that theoretically that should be possible within the experience builder. So the experience builder sort of framework that that is going to exist might be able to facilitate something like that. We haven't necessarily taken a look at in depth uh, on the amount of work or how feasible that is, but it's it's definitely something that we are um, we are tracking and probably going to have better idea in upcoming months once we have a better idea on what the actual architecture is going to be. But paragraphs is definitely an an interest for us because of paragraphs has a fairly sizable uh, user base. Um, so if we can, uh, you know, provide an improved page building experience for that pool of users, uh, that would definitely be a big win. All right. So a different lens on a on a similar question is is one of the goals of Experience Builder to completely replace Layout Builder and paragraphs, etc., or will they continue to exist alongside Experience Builder? So it's it's really hard to tell, um, you know, which part is this going to replace or not. But ultimately, I think if you are successful ex Experience Builder, uh, paragraphs and Layout Builder especially for newly built projects, would largely not be uh, that relevant. All right. So a more technical question is, uh, do we have a plan for preventing this causing even more revisions, orphan revisions, like we see with paragraphs? So we definitely want to learn from all of the different challenges that we faced with Layout Builder and Paragraphs. And we are trying to build an architecture where uh, those challenges don't happen with Experience Builder. And so the scalability issues that uh, PowerGraphs has around uh, its provision handling is definitely something that we've uh, tried to learn from with the Experience Builder. And we've been very conscious about the way that uh, we are in intending the data, be data to be stored so that it doesn't run into those same challenges. All right. Another type of challenge that multiple people asked is multilingual. So you organized will multilingual be supported unlike layout builder and paragraphs that both have some challenges related to that. And uh, Bob asked, will there be solutions for uh, both synchronous and asynchronous translations? Yes. So uh, we've in the architectures that we've, all of the architecture designs that we've done so far, multilingual is the capability that we've, uh, Keep in, uh, kept in mind, and uh, we are tracking both symmetric and asymmetric translations as part of what we are aiming to support with uh, with the experience builder. And uh, there's still some questions around uh, who should be making the decision around whether whether the content should be asymmetric or symmetric because of um, there's sort of our current hypothesis is that it might be even something that the content creator themselves should. Them, themselves should be able to decide. So that it's not something the builder decides for the content. Uh, today, it's obviously a side-wide decision. Um, there might be ways to enforce it on a side-wide, but we, there might be also ways where we provide that to be on per node basis so that, so that the content creator can, can make a decision on, on that. Uh, but yeah, definitely we are tracking both asymmetric and symmetric translations. At, at the moment, and we we we've already identified ways how we can make that happen with 
uh, sort of the architectures that we are currently planning to implement. All right. A more specific question of the other layout solutions is what happens if layout builder and experience builder are both enabled on the system? How would that work? Uh, they should be able to work together. So um, that might not be true today if you install the module because the module is still uh, heavily under development. But uh, ultimately, they should you should be able to have a system which has both of the modules installed without running in into problems. Obviously, there could be some confusion in terms of UX if you have like some some things using Layout Builder and some things using Experience Builder. But from technical perspective, they should work just fine. And same is true for for Paragraphs as well. All right. Uh, what kind of components are we seeing here? SDC, are they React-based? Um, yeah, so when we are talking about the components, uh, it is specifically uh, single directory components, SDC, that we are talking. And today, SDCs uh, contain YAML and uh, Twig to a large extent. You can obviously have CSS, JavaScript there as well. But uh, YAML and Twig are sort of the, the critical pieces to have in a single directory component. Um, in future, uh, we might, there's some concepts that we've done around um, using JavaScript in single directory components instead of Twig. And uh, that way we could even enable experiences where uh, JavaScript developers could be creating sing single directory components and write just YAML and a React component or a Vue component um, instead of Twig. Uh, but that's not something for the sort of phase one of this, but it's also something we are kind of tracking on the side and considering as something that we uh, maybe want to enable with sort of the foundation that we are we are building. So alongside this question, uh, Rajab asks, are you planning to manage only SDC UI editor with no space for block types? So only SDC web component entity types, or you also support block um, types of things? So blocks will definitely continue to exist. So blocks will be integrated with the experience builder. Um, so there's going to be some similar concepts to, to blocks, which we need to figure out whether we implement those using SDC or blocks, such as like uh, reusable blocks, which you want to be um, the same uh, across multiple pages. Those might be still using blocks, or they might be using something else. We haven't made a decision on that yet. Uh, regardless of what the decision on that is, blocks are going to uh, it's going to be a concept that is integrated with the uh, experience builder because of um, basically everything in Drupal uh, is is going through a block today. So if you have like a navigation uh, thing, you can put that on a page through a block. So we are not necessarily trying to re force everyone to re-implement all of that. So for things like navigation blocks, it's going to continue to work through the block system just like today, uh, even in future. Yeah, that goes well with Jurgen's question of will experience builder support content entities in general or just nodes? So I think it's safe to say that content entities in general. Um, yeah, so it will support uh, content entities in general, but we will probably optimize the experience for for nodes. All right, so there's a few UX questions. Uh, has anyone conducted UX research to drive the initiative from the end user's perspective? And there's another question on, do you have the opportunity to test with real users and get feedback on the assumed needs solutions and how can we validate yeah. these ideas? So did you do it before and can you do it ongoing? Yes, so we have, um, so we basically did some product discovery on this as research. We've also, um, done some UX testing on our concept wireframes uh, with uh, in collaboration with Acquia's UX department. And uh, we also have uh, UX researchers helping uh, re uh, bring more clarity around the different personas that are working with the experience builder. So we have different kinds of research that is going on. So we have both, we have um, like product discovery type of work that we've already done. We continue to do that. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, UX testing, um, usability testing, uh, which helps us better understand how, um, you know, the concepts that we're building or the, the UIs that we're building, how well they map 
with the user's mental models. And then we also have um, other type of uh, research that is just uh, doing more uh, on specific targeted UX aspects, which is not necessarily specifically tied into designs, but more around, uh, you know, what are, uh, how, how are our users using these kinds of systems and, you know, what are their backgrounds and all of that. So that, that can be fed into other research as, as uh, needed. Uh, this is one area where there's pro probably a lot of opportunity to also collaborate with us. So in case there's any UX researchers or UX designers, uh, there's probably a lot of opportunity to, to help us going forward. We're planning to continue the same where we um, basically we probably do designs for um, some weeks uh, or, and, and we form some hypothesis around what the ideal experience should be. And then we do UX testing around that to see how well that maps uh, in with the actual actual users. Great. Um, all right, let's see more editing questions. So it looks like the experience builder aims to take over the node edit form. Are the node settings changes under the cog in the upper right going to be available to other bundles that don't use components? Are the node settings? You had a cog in the upper right on the Figma. Let me thing. see the, I need to check the Figma. Oh yeah, all right, so there's, yeah sort of similar parallel track of work that Christina is working, where we might be taking some of these uh, concepts that we have in here and apply them outside of Experience Builder. Um, but sort of the code that we write for the Experience Builder to implement this is not going to be reusable outside of the Experience Builder. Great. Uh, there's also a similar note about the editor sidebar that doesn't seem wide enough, even when expanded for supporting a field with CK editor on it. Have you uh, thought about any approaches for supporting large text fields? So, um, so this is the part where I, I specifically highlighted that it's a constant wireframe because we don't um, necessarily know what is the exact design that we are going with in terms of when it comes to accommodating um, these large fields with with in a in a space. So there's sort of different kind of balances where you could do a dialogue, but then it's going to completely take over the page. Uh, or you could do something like the sidebar where it's a little bit less uh, invasive in terms of like how much space it takes on the page. Uh, that's something what we're probably specifically having to do test in a future round of user testing. And uh, uh, probably we are also going to um, ask for feedback from the community in terms of like coming up with scenarios that we should test with um, in terms of like what kinds of scenarios require um, a lot of space in there. And that's, I think one of the things that came up in user testing is that people don't understand that the sidebar can be already resized. There's not a thing that people understand that they can make it bigger. Yeah, it's that a, was fascinating because of, um, I, I brought that up in an internal stakeholder meeting and then some of our internal stakeholders even didn't know that it was resizable. They were surprised uh, that, that it could be resized. Yeah, indeed. So um, with the combination of edit and layout routes in the context of structured and freeform unstructured content creation, does this still allow the use of field-based blocks or tokens that are defined on the entity level? Will we be able to place unstructured data interstitially between the structured data fields template area? Um, yeah, so um, we are definitely planning to um, enable mixing uh, different uh, both structured and unstructured content. Uh, the current concept that we're thinking, I don't actually have anything on that in the concept wireframes. And I, I actually talked about this with Wim earlier today, and he was actually asking that maybe I could update the concept wireframes with that. So, uh, but basically the concept that we're thinking now in, in spoken words is that um, basically what you're adding to the um, canvas uh, when you're adding unstructured content is SDC components where you can uh, by default set up static properties. But besides setting static properties, what you could do is you could map a property into a um, into into a field, which is a, which is essentially the structured data in the node. So you could say, for example, 
that um, if I have a hero component, which has a text and an image, and then the, the node happens to have a title and an image field, you could map from that hero component, the text and the image into the into those fields that exist in the in the node itself. There's you know there's definitely some UX work to make that uh, really easy. Uh, there's some benefits in in the field the way that the field blocks work because you don't necessarily have to worry about the mapping itself. The downside of the field box approach is that you it's kind of its own concept. It doesn't map into components in your design system. So we're hoping that there might be a way for us to kind of try to combine the both where you could have the, the builder pre-configure some field blocks, which are essentially mappings of uh, node fields into components that exist in your, in your design system. This All also right. helps avoid the problem where today with the field blocks, the, the content creator is uh, responsible for selecting field formatters and configuring those which is uh, another stage which another step which in our user testing was was um a challenging one in terms of that the the content creator doesn't necessarily understand the questions that are being asked from them at that stage all right uh david asks if we have any considerations for touch-based interfaces ipads pcs smaller format screens uh so iPads and, and touch screens are, is definitely a consideration in terms of that we uh, would like to uh, enable that, but it's not necessarily uh, a top priority for us uh, right now. So I would say that it's prob probably something that we do is is aspirational to make all of those things work, but they might not be perfect, perfect end to end. All right. On the other side, do we have a plan on how these components will expose their content in a structured way for decoupled apps? Um, so that's where the mapping of the components comes in. So at the moment, the thinking is that what you have in the unstructured field is not going to be uh, exposed as a field to the uh, decoupled application. What the decoupled application would be able to access is they can, you know, get all of that the data they can get you know, they can get the whole blob of data from there. But if you need some specific data that you need to be able to map into, like let's say the university program's length, um, that would not be in the unstructured content. It would have to be in a field in the node, which you could then decide to consume within the, the unstructured content. Um, so ultimately, like we are, so basically what, what I'm saying is that we want content modeling as a concept to exist. Um, Unstructured content comes on top of that. It can connect to structured data. And you can consume all of that data in your decoupled applications. Uh, but the content that you have in the structured field is going to be much more meaningful because it actually has a specific meaning in there. So you can tell that this I can use for determining the length, for example, of the, of the uh, university program. All right, there's uh, two transitional questions or notes, I guess. So uh, one of them from Hemant is that using the UI pattern ecosystem, one component can easily be used with views, blocks, paragraphs, and can also be used as a section of layout builder. This requires a lot of setup, uh, but I think, but he thinks that we can fast track it with recipes. And then we might be able to focus more on improving the UX and storage model of things in the back end. I think that would be a suggestion for having something in the meantime while we don't have experience builder, but you may understand. Yeah, I think there's, and, and there could be another suggestion, which is that we should look at the components beyond just the experience builder so that they exist as a universal concept that you can uh, use outside of the experience builder. And um, I, I do think that we, sh I agree that we should build the components in a way where you can leverage that outside of the experience builder. And uh, then if, if folks want to integrate those with, for example, views, that would be something that could happen, even if it's not worked on by the experience builder team. Another similar proposal, I guess, is there is that would be a good idea to have paragraphs move to core and have structured content as a first class citizen first. 
um, Latin things that, that would help uh, the experience builder because that would introduce the structure, the more like piece by piece structured content first. What do you think about that? I'm not sure I fully grasp the, the, the question or, or what are the intended benefits, but that might be an interesting discussion to have on Slack. And I would be very interested to hear more about uh, your thoughts on that. All right. Uh, so Nora asks that one of the common challenges with blocks is how there are often two parts, config and content. There has been longstanding desire to have the option to store block content as config for deploy purposes. Does Experience Builder help to solve this problem in any way? Uh, so deployments is definitely uh, one sort of user journey that we are tracking. And I don't know if we have all of the all of all of the specific solutions to these nailed down right now, but we are sort of we are thinking about that a little bit differently from the layout builder perspective that we are taking a more holistic look at what changes do we need both in the experience builder, but also the underlying systems in order to facilitate facilitate those user journeys. Moving uh, block content, especially on the sort of uh, display mode, view mode layer is part of the user journey of moving your, um, you know, template content to this uh, view modes from one environment to another. Uh, and therefore it's something we need to uh, consider as part of uh, this pro uh, project. But you know, there's there's a lot of problems like that that exist there. So it's hard to guarantee that all of them will be solved, but at least by the initial initial release. So in terms of storage, Mark Berger asks, one of the challenges we have is how blocks are stored in the database for a layout builder. Whereas with paragraphs, we have found it a lot easier to perform lookups, pre-processing, et cetera. Will the storage model change with this or will it be essentially the same layout builder storage on the back end with paragraphs on top of it? So the architecture is still um, not fully set in stone, but the current proposal is to use a JSON based data storage, which is an improvement on top of the layout builder storage because layout builder is essentially just storing uh, serialized PHP arrays, which is not something that you can query uh, through databases. Um, so with the JSON based data storage, you can write database queries to, to find content. Uh, some of those things don't exist today, but they could be added on top of it later. All right, uh, Eric asks, I see here user can create a template in the UI and I can't help but think contemplate. Is the context and history of contemplate and its drawbacks being actively avoided for the implementation within Experience Builder? I'm not familiar with um, contemplate, so that might be an interesting um, uh, you know, project to, to research. Uh, Lucky Eric, if you have- uh, Eric, if you have any links or uh, resources that you want to share, or if you just want to grab time to to talk through that, I'm you know very curious about that one as well. Yeah, I can ping you in Slack. Um, it's an old vestige of D6 and previous. All right. Thanks, All right. Eric. Um, we have a lot more. Um, so. A lot of uh, the focus of the DreesNet was around being able to theme the site through the browser. Will Experience Builder be able to style elements outside of the page, like the header and footer, site menus, et cetera, or content that would be themed by a custom template like a view? Um, yes. So ultimately, Experience Builder will be managing all of that. The sort of first phase of what we are focusing on Experience Builder is just purely on the content itself. However, we are architecting and designing the interface and, and, and all of the, the fundamentals so that we could use those same foundations to build other capabilities like um, a component builder or just like a global page builder. I don't know what to call the whole canvas that includes the header and footer and, and, and everything, like the block layout experience. So basically the, the data storage and, and, and all of that uh, should be able to facilitate uh, create, uh, creating those capabilities in in the future.
Um, all right. Uh, in terms of UX, what's the idea behind the use of the canvas and the panning thing with it? Was that a huge request in the UX exploration? It's. I would say that the the, the canvas and the panning is still an exp exploration that we're doing. We wanted to add it, it to the Experience Builder module so that we can actually uh, user test that eventually and to see what kind of feedback we have. That's something that in particular is really challenging for us to test with Figma design. So that's why uh, it is part of the the, the prototype in, uh, in Drupal. I think in um, th there might be a difference in terms of what we expect that to be for building pages versus building components. So it could, for example, make sense that the panning makes sense when you're building components, but it might not make sense when you are creating pages. So none of that is still uh, decided or, or defined. Uh, at the moment, it's just experimental code, which uh, we would be doing some more research on in future. All right. Uh, experience builder in the context of Starshot. Uh, Jürgen says that we need a range of generic prepared themes if we as a community want to start competing with the likes of WordPress. Is this part of the plan to set up a team or encourage agencies to build themes to be ready in time? So yeah, the whole theme ecosystem and, and design systems built for Experience Builder is going to be a focus for this. It's not a focus for us right now because it's a little bit early for, for that at the moment. But um, it is definitely something that we need to think about, uh, I would say, in 2025, uh, once we are a little bit closer to uh, launching Experience Builder. Great. Um, so what we've seen in the mockups uh, was a desktop display. Will Experience Builder support controlling or at least previewing a tablet or a mobile layout, like a preview of how it would look like on a tablet or a mobile? Yeah, so there will definitely be mobile and tablet preview within the Experience Builder. That was easy. Um, all right. Uh, so there's some marketing questions from Dallas. Uh, from a marketing perspective, what is a concise message about how Experience Builder differs from existing alternatives such as Gutenberg and Wix? So I think that comes to the mission statement, and and we can probably there's I can define a little bit more. Uh, there's there's a longer version of this which can help uh, add a little bit more nuance to that, but ultimately. Uh, the experience builder will be better for content reuse across channels. So you can uh, build, uh, fetch your data to decoupled applications, and it's going to be better for man managing content at a large scale. So basically, we are going to uh, build the system on top of design system, which allows you to control how you, which allows you to enforce design consistency uh, across uh, several pages, but it also allows you to do things like uh, rebrand, for example, within the system, because of uh, you can change those components later on, and it's going to just it's going to update all of the pages that are using those components. So I would say that those are, um, especially in um, the, the key differentiators against uh, Wix and on Gutenberg, there would be a key uh, additional key differentiator, which is that it's going to be really easy for uh, front end developers and builders to extend it with their own custom design systems, where Gutenberg is really good uh, uh, when you use sort of the built-in blocks that it ships with. But you, if you want to integrate it with a pre-built design system, it can take a little bit of uh, juggling to get that uh, integrated with it. All right. And I think in general, Dallas also asks what are the main comp competitive advantages of the experience builder compared to similar tools on the market? More general, I guess, than good. Um, so I think those are the, the ones that we are tracking in, in general. So uh, better for content in scale, uh, easier for builders to, to integrate. Um, then there's obviously like points of parity types of things that we need to track on. So for example, on the ease of use for content creators, we definitely have to uh, be equally good um, as, our, as our competitors. So we can't uh, uh, lack behind on that end. 
That's great. Thanks, Larry. All right. Um, so Ratrap says that they tested using the layout builder with cards and teasers, but it seems that it was intended to be used with the full content page. Are we looking at only a full content landing page editor or do we have a space for supporting teasers, for example, like laying, laying out teasers? Um, yeah, so definitely other display modes and component building is, is part of the, the roadmap for us. Uh, the first stage is, is pages, what we're starting with, and then we are expanding that to components and sort of the um, uh, different concepts that are smaller part than a page that would be then used to, to generate uh, a full page as a result. All right, Nick asked, uh, what about other entities like micro content or storage? That was the whole question, uh, like supporting editing them, I guess. So, so we are planning to support things. I, I'm wondering if this is referring to um, uh, like reusable micro content. Uh, is Nick still in here? Maybe not. All right. So assuming that this is related to reusable micro content. So that is definitely something that we are planning uh, to support. So basically, if you need to have um, some sort of uh, hero component, which you're using across multiple pages that you can create that type of uh, component that you then centrally manage and use on, on multiple pages, including the text and all of the content within that component. All right. Um, Simon asks, not sure if asked already, are there plans for inline editing? Uh, and also how would larger forms such as media library work with the sidebar? Would there be a model yep. that they would show up in? Um, so inline editing is something that uh, we would have to look at from technical perspective. I act, uh, There's actually a meeting happening tomorrow on one of the sort of fundamental technical architectural pieces that uh, is critical for us to be able to support inline editing, editing in future. Um, so maybe after tomorrow we have a better idea on if that's if some if that's something that is feasible for us in the in the short term or or not. But inline editing is definitely something that, from user experience perspective, um, seems um, important, especially in some scenarios. So we are doing some research around that at the moment. Uh, what comes to the media library question? I would imagine that the media library is opening in a modal, just like it is opening today when you are uh, interacting with it. All right. Uh, so Milan asks, can you tell us more about the caching implementation for dynamic content with all of these components? I don't know if I can tell more about caching. Uh, that might be something that Wim could talk about at some point because he knows whole bunch of things related to caching. And finally, Chega says that JS React View would be dreamy eyes instead of Twig. Yeah. Is that um, on the roadmap? Yeah, it, it is it is on the roadmap, but not on the initial release. So um yeah, we're definitely tracking on how we could enable something like that. So basically the ask that we've heard is that there's a lot of organizations who are doing uh, headless because they have developers who are already familiar with JavaScript frameworks, uh, but they don't necessarily want to take, they don't necessarily need all of the flexibility that comes with headless and all of the, the cost associated with that as a result. And they would be willing to go with an approach where they can just kind of integrate their um, React or Vue components with Drupal somewhat as, as it exists t today and uh, then be done with it. The great thing about uh, if we can make the uh, integration with SDC happen is that then we can simplify the whole front end uh, developer experience quite a bit because if you don't necessarily have to deal with uh, um, complex uh, render arrays as a result of this. So all of the rendering becomes a little bit more predictable and compared to how it's today. So that's also an added benefit of the experience builder.
All right, so we'll finish on this dreamy eyes, I guess. Uh, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Um, we'll have an AMA on Thursday at 7 a.m. GMT. So that's going to be great for those that this time is bad for them. That time will be much better. Um, so we we'll hope to see you there. And next week, we don't have any online sessions planned because a lot of us will be at Drupal Dev Days. If we can see some of you, that would be great. We'll work on a lot of stuff for Starshot next week in Bulgaria, Drupal Dev Days with Larry and Christina and Suzanne and a lot of other people. So thanks everybody for coming today. We'll post the recording when it becomes available. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.